Hello, everyone. This is Mackenzie Rockliffe from the American Forest Foundation and the American Tree Farm System. The American Tree Farm System is the largest and oldest sustainable woodland system in America. We work to give our tree farmers the tools they need to be effective stewards of America's natural heritage. And um, the American Tree Farm System is a program of the American Forest Foundation, so don't get confused. But this um, forest farming, non-timber forest products series, we have some wonderful partners that have helped us put this together, including the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, the USDA National Agroforestry Center, the USDA Forest Service, and the Extension Forest Farming Community of Practice. So a big thank you to all those that helped put this together. And we've had some wonderful um, webinars so far. I don't know if any of you have attended them. Um, I'm missing one from this. There's going to be also one on forest art products that you can get or different things you can use to you know, dye things. Um, and I think that one's going to be in late November. Yeah. Um, but today we're on forest brews, and we've got two great brewsters. I can attest because I've tried their brews before, and I'm still kicking. And so we have Al Robertson and Mike Burns. And um, one other thing that you guys should know, there are no CFE credits for this course. I wonder why. So if you're interested in continuing forestry education credits, I would suggest one of the other webinars in this series, because um, we do have CFEs for those, but not this one. And the slides and a recording of this presentation will be sent to all registrants. So. That is another important thing that many people ask. But also, if you have any questions about the content or just questions for me, you can just type them in the chat, and I'll be monitoring that all the time. So with that, I will hand it over to Al Robertson. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about making hard cider. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, from the slide there, you can see There we go. What we're going to be talking about today, uh, you'll have to pardon my doing this a little bit slow. This is my first time in, uh, in doing one of these. And to lead off, I wanted to talk about the references that you're going to be seeing at the end of the presentation so you'll know which ones to buy. Uh, the first publication by Brest Orton, who's an old Vermonter, the American Cider Book, is probably the book that you'd want to purchase first if you find this presentation interesting and want to try making hard cider on your own. Uh, Mr. Orton died some years ago, but uh, he was in touch with his ancestors that were the Vermonters that were making hard cider when hard cider was the real drink in the United States. Uh, that book is available on Amazon. Uh, it's been through 10 to 15 printings, and it's a good basic publication for the beginner. Uh, the last reference there, the Annie Proulx and Lou Nichols book, if you're successful, with the Rest Orton book, that would be the book to buy to find out more details and more uh, sophistication that you might want to explore in making hard cider. Uh, so uh, those are the two publications that really cover cider ma making. The middle publication by Lewis Hill basically lists the, uh, the apple types that are good for making cider, and we'll talk about that when we get into it. Okay. Um, History of cider goes back a long way. Uh, a lot of people drink a lot of cider, and primarily the reason why they did that was that it was the one thing that you could drink that was like water that wouldn't kill you in the Middle Ages. Uh, in the United States, cider was the drink from all the settlers and all of the colonists. And maybe the most interesting thing is the number of apple varieties that they developed in the United States in the 1800s. Uh, the scary thing is that by 1870, there were over 4,000 varietals of apples growing in the United States. And the only thing that really put an end to uh, uh, drinking apple cider in the United States was, was beer. Mike's going to cover that in the second part of the presentation. But the introduction uh, and the, and the uh, sophistication of the beer uh, companies and the, uh, the information on that really, really led to the downfall of apple cider, which now is coming back. Um, in deciding what you're going to uh, make that apple cider out of, uh, one of the things that stands out in all of the, the uh, material that you read is variety. 
there are two or three apple varieties that were considered to be the varieties for making apple cider, but uh, uh, primarily the best thing you can do is go out and find as many varieties as you can. Uh, traditionally, um, eating apples, uh, what they call dessert apples, are not necessarily the best uh, apples for making cider. Uh, the varietals that, uh, that I've grown for a number of years are considered the, uh, the ancient varietals. They're very ugly. They tend to be small. They're very hard. They're scabby. Uh, but they have uh, uh, characteristics in the juice that make them very, very uh, good for making apple cider. And, uh, and again, uh, once you read up on it, the more variety, the more neutrals, tarts, and aromatics you can get, the better. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, literature on, on what makes a good one, but the best thing to do is to maybe travel around and try and find as many wild or, uh, or old orchards as you can to come up with the apples for making your cider. Um, crab apples can be used, but uh, be warned that uh, they, they, uh, they will kill not only bacteria, but they can, be, uh, they can really slow the yeast down when you make your cider, so you don't want to put too many of those in uh, if you've never done that before. And, and as far as our presentation today, again, uh, uh, there's quite a bit of sophistication in, in the intricacies of making good cider once you get past your first good batch. And you can get into this as deeply as all of the wine connoisseurs do in the United States. So uh, you really, that's when that second text would come in handy. Uh, we're not really going to get into that kind of detail today, though. One of the things that I kind of found out and, and has been exacerbated by global warming is that the apples don't all ripen at the same time. Uh, here in Vermont, we've seen uh, almost a month's worth of change since I started making my apples, so that the apples are now uh, ripening earlier and earlier, but my ability to make cider and store it at the right temperature is getting later and later. So I end up storing apples for a long time and uh, then trying to figure out uh, how I'm going to keep that cider around so that I can make uh, hard cider, so I can do it all at one time. So there are different ways you can do that, but these are the characteristics that you ought to be storing your apples at. You can also freeze sweet cider, but the downside to that is that it tends to kill the yeast if it's in the freezer for very long. So sometimes or it's probably better to try and just refrigerate your cider as you press it, uh, keeping it very close to freezing. Uh, the yeast won't take effect then. And then when you've got all of the cider pretty much and all of the apples, then you put it into the containers and begin your fermenting. One of the first questions that comes up is, can I use grounders? Uh, it really depends on, on how long they've been on the ground and the condition that they're in. Uh, the books don't recommend using grounders, but uh, I've used grounders in the past several times, uh, generally picking them up within 24 hours of them being grounders, and I really haven't noticed that that's had a detrimental effect on the cider. Obviously, picking them off the tree is a better way to go, but if you live in the country, you find that you're not the only one picking apples. So if you're going around every day, uh, sometimes it, 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 it's just uh, the way it works that you end up getting grounders. Um, and in any case, you're going to have to wash the apples before you make that cider anyway. Depending on where your apples were laying, uh, you need to put that much effort into the washing. Uh, there'll be a, a slide coming up in the, in the next few that will show the, the way I operate it. But in general, uh, since I'm in an orchard without animals and I'm picking mainly apples off the trees or, or like 24-hour apples on the ground, I'm basically rinsing them off with water. Uh, if you've got animals a lot of animals or a lot of birds or you have a problem with, uh, with stuff going on in that orchard uh, where there might be some negative influences to the apples, you may have to take a little bit more care in washing them. As far as the, uh, the equipment, uh, those are some names of, of, uh, of the press that I use, the press and the apple grinder. Uh, but I would, again, go on the Internet. There are more and more companies that are providing uh, that kind of equipment, and it is a little pricey, but it's, uh, you can start small and just decide how big you want to get. And if you're just interested in trying it uh, for the heck of it some weekend, uh, it doesn't even take a press. Uh, my neighbor for many years used a, a, a uh, 
borrowed front end loader that he put the apples between two sheets of plywood and just run the front end loader over it and collect the juice. It's a little primitive, but uh, uh, he claimed that he got pretty good uh, cider from it. Uh, the idea here is to crush the apples, but don't crush them to the point where you're crushing the seeds. Uh, and again, uh, depending on, on how you do it, uh, you'll probably decide whether you want to get more involved. I would not recommend using cider from the grocery store. Uh, federal laws on the sale of cider changed some time ago, and now all of that cider is, uh, has been pasteurized. And once it's pasteurized, all of the yeast that you need on the, uh, in the cider to make that cider ferment have been destroyed, they've been killed. There's a photo of the, uh, the Happy Valley Press. It allows you to be uh, grinding apples as you uh, uh, actually are uh, uh, pressing the other, uh, the other barrel there. Um, Pumice size is important. This thing will grind it up into very, very small, almost an applesauce type chunk. Uh, it doesn't destroy the seeds. And this, this press right here is uh, generally giving me about two gallons a bushel for apple cider. That's what the, uh, the little grinder looks like inside that press. Now uh, this photo kind of shows the whole nine yards as far as what's going on uh, once you have your apples and you're getting ready to press them and, and put the cider away. Um, on the lower left hand side is a garden way cart with a little box with a rat screen on the bottom where the apples are placed. You can just barely make out a little red apple there in the corner. And I use a, a whitewash brush to kind of move the apples around after uh, uh, washing them with a hose a couple of times, uh, basically a wash cycle and a rinse cycle, just to make sure that if there's any, uh, any uh, twigs, leaves, uh, bird dew, or anything like that on the apples that we've, we've rinsed it off. Uh, once uh, they're cleaned, then they go into a, a mud bucket, uh, and then they're fed into the, uh, the hopper there on the grinder. They're ground up. They go in the back press. And if you look at that um, below the press there, you'll see there's like a brown cloth over the top of the, uh, the uh, container. That's the uh, liner. It's a cheesecloth liner that goes in. Uh, you fill that up, and you move that uh, forward. You put the uh, actual press, which is sitting on the front end loader bucket, on top of it and you start pressing. Uh, I've got my jugs lined up there, and I've got a little pitcher there to put it in. And you can see, actually, on the lower left hand of the entrance to the, the uh, barn there, there's about a half a gallon of uh, cider that's been pressed out from the previous batch. So that's about the uh, process uh, of just getting the apples, uh, washing, uh, grinding, pressing, and then putting the cider away. Fermenting. Um, there's a certain amount of equipment that you're going to need. Uh, generally, everyone that I've seen that uh, does this kind of work finds glass carboys. And in the United States, there's been a proliferation of an awful lot of your wine and beer uh, home uh, shops where you can buy all this equipment. And anything that you, you need to make cider is the same stuff that you need to make wine and beer. So you can get your carboy. You'll have to have an airlock because uh, making cider is an anaerobic process. You don't want any air or oxygen in that uh, carboy when you're making uh, uh, cider, and the airlock keeps the uh, bad bacteria and the oxygen away from the, the uh, cider. Uh, if, you, if you have cider that's exposed to oxygen or air for any length of time uh, when you're in the process of making uh, hard cider, uh, you're going to... Uh, uh, end up generally with something that's harsh and vinegary and may actually turn into vinegar. Um, I notice there's some questions coming up. I'm going to wait until the end of this to answer the questions. Um, the most critical thing about fermenting is the temperature, and the Rest Orton book uh, probably covers that better than any of the other publications. Uh, you want a temperature of 50 degrees to make your hard cider. Uh, it can be a little bit lower. It can be a little bit higher, but uh, the yeasts that you're looking for are happiest at 50 degrees, and that's where that cider should be during the entire process. 
I'm lucky because up here in Vermont right now my basement is just about dropped down to and I've got a uh, cider down there now at 51 degrees and in about another month and a half to two months I'm going to have to start heating the container or the, the enclosure where those cider carboys are to keep them uh, at 50 degrees it'll, it'll drop down to like 35. So uh, for a lot of you in the, in, uh, in the banana belt below Vermont, you're going to be looking at um, probably some kind of a modified refrigerator uh, or some uh, device like that that will give you a 50 degree temperature for making the cider. Um, yeast. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of discussion about adding yeast uh, as a starter. Um, I did that for a number of years, but uh, I read an article that indicated that the, uh, the really high quality wineries have given up that uh, process and are now relying on the yeast that are on the grapes to produce the wines that they're looking for. Uh, I've gone that route too, uh, and if you read uh, the, the chemistry of, of making the cider, uh, not only do the apples have that yeast on them, but over a period of years if you're using that press and your equipment, it all has that yeast on it from year to year and you're relying on that yeast on the apple's uh, surface uh, to find its way into the cider. It'll get it off of the, uh, the liner and the press. It'll get it off the press. And those yeasts are the ones that you're looking for that are going to make good cider. Uh, that's a photo of my uh, basement. You can see the uh, the glass carboys lined up down there. Uh, if you're careful, you'll notice there's a plastic one that uh, that was not used to make hard cider. Um, and they have uh, airlocks, but that photo will be coming up. The uh, cider uh, jugs that the sweet cider is stored in before I put it into the carboys is up there on the shelf on the right. And that uh, insulated uh, enclosure that you see sitting on the uh, the brick wall is where the cider ends up uh, where I can keep it warm when the temperature in the basement falls. Uh, this is kind of a split level basement. If you're wondering why there appear to be so many steps in it, um, the house sits on bedrock and I cast the floor around the bedrock so that I would at least have a flat surface. So there's three or four different elevations in the floor. Also on that picture is the, uh, the capper, which we'll talk about. That's the capper for uh, bottling it, and on the left there is a carboy with an airlock on it. Uh, the little plastic uh, strip on the carboy is something that you can buy in a wine or beer shop uh, that has temperature range on it, uh, just to ensure that uh, you're keeping your cider at the right temperature. That's the airlock. It has a little bit of water in it. It allows the carbon dioxide to escape as the uh, cider is fermenting, keeps out the, uh, the bad bacteria. That's this year's cider. Uh, I pressed out about 22 gallons of cider uh, over the last three weeks, kept uh, a lot of it in the refrigerator because I couldn't uh, I really couldn't uh, get all of the apples that I needed at one time. Uh, it was a very, very bad apple year in Vermont, uh, up in the higher elevations. And I ended up actually going out and collecting apples from along uh, one of our state highways here in the, up in northern Vermont, uh, off the trees that uh, generally line the, the roads to come up with enough to do it. Uh, and you can see where it's been in those carboys now for a couple of days, and we already have some leaves settling out in the bottom of the carboy. This has not started to ferment yet. Uh, because I don't add any yeast, uh, it'll sit in there for a week or so before it, it really begins to, uh, to bubble a little bit. But the, the heavy stuff has already settled out. I might also add that if, when you're pressing, uh, you really need to watch out and keep the flies and the uh, bees and wasps out of the cider. Uh, they carry the, uh, uh, the bacteria that can cause cider to turn to vinegar. Uh, you don't, you, you know, you really can't help keeping some of the worms out of the apples because those are the kind of apples that cider apples are. But you definitely need to put a screen on the cider as you're collecting it to keep all of the uh, flying insects out of it uh, that will attempt to drown themselves in the cider as you're pressing. Okay, so you've pressed it, you've collected it. You've got it in your carboy and you've uh, got an airlock on it and it's at the right temperature. 
Uh, your duration for your fermenting, uh, it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, a single fermentation of apple cider generally goes through two cycles. It'll go through a, an, a, an initial very, very fast uh, cycle, um, and then it'll go very, very slow. And after the fast cycle, after it really stops, ap after that uh, uh, airlock stops bubbling so much, uh, you rack the cider, you take it out of that carboy uh, with a siphon to leave the lees in the, in the uh, carboy. Uh, that clarifies it a little bit. And then it undergoes a second slower fermentation. And when that fermentation is uh, just about complete, uh, you'll probably have maybe 3 or 4% alcohol and a little CO2. And at that time, I go into a second fermentation. Uh, that's to boost the alcohol content and to ensure that I have CO2. Uh, my cider goes through two fermentations and generally comes up with between 7 and 8% alcohol. It's a little bit strong, but uh, I think it, uh, it definitely adds to the flavor, too. Uh, you don't have to use sugar. You can use any number of, of sweeteners. You can use honey. Uh, you can uh, add other berry juices. Uh, there's a number of things that, that can go in. You can use maple syrup. Uh, something that I'm, I'm going to try this year on the second fermentation. Uh, a lot of it depends on exactly what you're looking for. For somebody who's just starting, I would recommend just going through one fermentation, uh, the natural fermentation, the two cycle, and seeing whether you like it or not. Uh, for many, many people, that's more than enough, and that's pretty much what you're getting commercially right now, although I think you'll be amazed at how good yours tastes compared to what you can buy in the store. Bottling, um, there's just about the, the sky's the limit. You can use wine bottles or beer bottles. Uh, either way, you're going to have to find some way to cap them. Uh, cappers are, are generally a lot easier and cheaper to use than the, than the uh, uh, wine bottles, but if you drink a lot of wine, there's nothing wrong with it. Just ensure that you've got a wine bottle that can take the pressure. They have a concave bottom. Uh, a wine bottle with a flat bottom is probably not going to be a good bottle to use for this. Storage. Um, I've had cider stored in my basement for upwards of 10 years now. I've had some in, in other locations. Uh, the longer you can keep it cool, the better it will taste. Um, I've actually got a couple of bottles that have now been in, uh, in storage for about almost 30 years. They were bottled when I got back from Germany when I tried a small batch. And I can, I can tell you that uh, like a very, very good brandy, uh, Cider does not go bad if it's been properly stored. Uh, it can last an awful long time. There's my basement. That's uh, the equivalent of around uh, eight or nine years worth of, uh, of uh, cider, and those are generally all beer bottles. They were uh, rescued, or I have friends that donate them. Uh, and that makes it a lot easier to uh, save money on, on exactly how deep you want to get into this. Uh, if you can notice by the bottles, the first people who were donating were generally donating Corona, but in the last few years it's been just about everything. Uh, I think Sam Adams thinks probably the best bottle because it's not a screw cap, and when you buy a cap, you realize that uh, the old-fashioned bottles uh, that don't have the screw indentations on the top are a lot easier to cap than a regular the newer bottles that they have. There's all kinds of results that you will get uh, when you're fermenting your, your cider. Um, there are hundreds of different yeasts that are at work in that cider when you're fermenting it. Um, basically, you're looking for either a drier or a sweeter uh, fruity cider. Some people prefer a champagne-like cider that's very dry. Uh, some people would prefer to really taste the apples. Uh, I think if you've tasted a lot of the commercial varieties, you'll find they tend to be on the dry, uh, champagne-y side. Um, at 50 degrees when you ferment, you end up with ciders that generally are, are intermediates. They, they can be very fruity. Uh, they can also be dry, but they, uh, they definitely all taste a lot more apple -y 
than the ciders that you buy in the store. Uh, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about doing this. I really uh, obviously never knew what I was doing when I started this. Most people don't. You kind of do it on a wing and a prayer. And I was amazed at the apple flavor that you get in a homemade cider compared to the ciders that you buy commercially. Um, you can aim your ciders for specifics, but that's where it gets quite a bit more sophisticated and you may need to uh, watch your temperatures and your additives even more closely. Um, but again, if it looks like it's getting towards vinegar, uh, that means that uh, there was a, a bad bacteria in there that uh, found enough oxygen either in the, uh, the air or the cider or in maybe some uh, impurity that got in the cider to turn it towards vinegar. And having, assuming your batch isn't too big, a little bit of vinegar can be used for other things, including cooking. Uh, one of the things that you can use vinegar for is switchel. Uh, in, the old, in the old days, in the 1800s, when they were uh, haying, uh, uh, the drink du jour that everybody had when they were haying, which is a very, very hot, dry work, was a, uh, a liquid that had uh, a little bit of vinegar in it, cold water, a little bit of taste, which was maple syrup or molasses, and it really, really cut the thirst. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, recipes for this. This is a very traditional one, but if uh, if you're if you're uh, really hot during the summer and you're really dry and you don't want to get any alcohol involved in it, which is the way to go. It's kind of like a uh, the ancient variety of a soda pop, but it's you can kind of uh, aim the calories in the direction that you want. There's my orchard. Uh, that's about half the orchard. There's, there's another half on the other side of the road, plus a few other apple trees scattered around. Uh, these trees are, are in pretty good shape, but they, they didn't bear any apples this year because of the trees around it. Uh, this is truly a forest orchard. All the way around this orchard are 80-foot trees, so they don't get as much sun as they should, and they uh, generally only produce about every other year. Okay, there are the references, and now I'm going to uh, start going through the questions. Uh, let's see, first question is, any information on sassafras tea? Uh, no, I don't, I don't. Um, I don't have any information on that, but I'm sure if you Google it, you can find some. Uh, tea from pine needles? Question, I read somewhere that a tea can be made from pine needles. Have you heard anything about this? Um, Yes, I have, but I don't have any uh, information on that either. Uh, that was, a, I think the article that I saw was either written in New York in the Adirondacks or possibly in Maine, so Googling that might help. Um, let's see, can a brew be made from maple syrup? Yes, it can. Um, I'll actually be covering that in just a couple of minutes here, Al. Uh, thank you, Mike. I know that I know that in Vermont they're making some liqueurs out of maple syrup uh, using the freezing process. But I'll let Mike talk about that. Um, let's see in the uh, in the fermentation process. Oh, birch beer. What about birch beer? Um, I have nothing about that either. I know there's some internet stuff on birch beer. It's coming back. People are making it, um, but I don't know anything about that. Uh, in the fermentation process, any thoughts? And managing fruit flies. Um, gosh, that's a good question. I don't think you're going to have a problem with fruit flies if you if you've got a cloth like a piece of cheesecloth over the gallon container as you're pressing and collecting. That should keep the flies out of the cider. Uh, once they're in that container, then you're golden. So it would be just something while you're while you're actually uh, uh, pressing. Uh, once you make the cider, how long is the shelf life without free refrigeration? Um, I would say without any re refrigeration, you're probably limited to maybe two days, uh, depending on what yeast that cider has been exposed to. Obviously, the bad yeasts are going to be working on it immediately because it's warmer. Uh, so getting it uh, refrigerated is very critical. Uh, the sooner you do that, the better chance you have of ultimately ending up with a quality hard cider. 
so during fermentation, the brew needs to be covered and insulated to main temperatures of around 50 degrees. Uh, yes, it's not covered. It's in a carboy with an airlock. Uh, make, uh, make sure that you've got uh, that airlock on the carboy so that the carbon dioxide can escape, but no air with oxygen can get in. Um, in the past, we made a great cider from ornamental crab apples. Have you heard of this? Well, I've got Dolgo crabs, and I add those to the cider on occasion, uh, but that is incredibly bitter, so I would, I would wonder whether you'd have a hard time getting the yeast to work on it. Uh, you might have to change the temperature. That's a varietal of apple that it might require quite a bit of an experimentation to find out how to do that. Um, we made a great wine from wild cherries and grapes. Any thoughts on this? Um, I, I think if you're making wine, I think if you're making wine and you've already got this ace, it shouldn't be that difficult. Your temperatures are a little bit different, but that's the only difference. Uh, the comment or the question was: It looks like the containers are five-gallon bottles. Is this correct? The carboys that I know that are being sold today are six-gallon. There are five gallons still out there. I think you can probably get three-gallon. Uh, I think if you go to a wine and beer store. Uh, they will tell you what's available. It really doesn't matter. You just buy more of them if you want to make more. Um, what about wormy apples? The worms are okay, assuming you know you're not you're not half worms on that apple. Uh, and I would say on the quality of the apple, you're you're wanting apples that are pretty sound. If they've got a lot of very black or brown spots of rot, uh, you want to cut those out. Um, you want to minimize the number of worms in your cider. A little meat's okay, but uh, in general, you'd want to try and keep that number of apples to a minimum. Uh, next question, so at a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit and anaerobic, these bacteria operate slower than the aerobic bacteria, correct? Uh, well, they operate because there's no oxygen to encourage the bad ones, but basically you're correct. Uh, next question, if the cider turns to vinegar, can... Can you use honey to make it edible? Um, I don't know. I suspect not. Uh, next question, what about maple syrup as a sweetener? Yes, you can use maple syrup as a sweetener. I have a dangerous story about that. I attempted to use a drop of maple syrup on flat hard cider to give it a little boost of CO2 in the bottle so that it would, uh, it would have a little CO2 when, it was, uh, when you'd open it up. It turns out that... Uh, uh, one drop of, of uh, maple syrup is about a huge teaspoon of sugar, and I ended up with a, a huge detonation in the basement several years ago when all of the bottles blew up. So you've got to be very careful about adding uh, any sweetener to your hard cider after you've bottled it, or as you're, as you're bottling it. Uh, for storing that much alcohol, do you need any kind of license? You're allowed by the federal government, I believe, to make 600 gallons of alcoholic beverages a year uh, without any license or registration or anything like that. Uh, next question, if, changes, if it changes to vinegar, can it be used for salad dressing? Absolutely. Uh, no reason why not, it's just vinegar. Uh, next question, do pears make a good cider as well? Pears make a very good, and there's a name for it, Mike, you can help me here, when you press uh, pears, what do you get? Um, with my brother, it ended up as pear wine. I don't know exactly what the other name of it would be. There's, there's a name for pears when you press them, and I've just forgotten what it is. But yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, a comment, you do not use sulfites. No, I don't use any sulfites. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't. And the, uh, the uh, Pruel in Nichols' book covers all of the chemistry and, uh, around preservatives, uh, chemicals that are used to kill bad bacteria, and other uh, additives that uh, encourage the good bacteria. Uh, let's see. How many trees do you have in your orchard? I've got about 30 trees, and do you generally only use all your own apples? Up until this year, I used only my own apples, but this year, because of the off year of my trees and the fact that we had a lot of rain and frost about the time the blossoms came out, uh, I ended up going around in my car with a couple of bushel baskets asking people if they wanted their apples and basically picking other people's apples either off the tree along the road or out of their yard. Um, I was able to come up with enough apples to make around 22 gallons, but as far, from a variety standpoint, 
this is going to be an incredibly interesting year. I have a large percentage of wild apples. I have a large percentage of, of varietals I have never used before, but they're clearly not eating apples. Uh, variety is the name of this year, and it's going to be real interesting to see what it tastes like. Um, what about pear hard cider? Well, I think we just talked about pears. You can make hard, hard pear, whatever it's called. That'll work. I just Googled it, and it's called Perry. Perry, there we go. That's the word I was looking for. I had a senior moment. Uh, we actually got some helpful answers from the crowd, too. Alan, Sean, and Philip all volunteered Perry. So we got an educated crowd here. <laughs> outstanding. Okay. Uh, Mr. Atkinson asks, uh, do you try to aerate your sweet cider when starting the ferment? Um, no, no, I don't. Splashing is okay. I've never heard that, uh, that phrase before. I'm going to have to think about that one. But no, I, I press that stuff. Immediately it goes into a, uh, a one-gallon container. It's capped, and it's refrigerated. So it is as close to being in the apple as it can be until I accumulate enough to put into the carboy. Uh, and, and Alan, I can jump in on that too because it goes as well for beer. And the point is that um, uh, uh, you don't want to get the air in the liquid. The whole idea is to get the air out so it's all anaerobic and the yeast gets a chance to work. Absolutely. Oh, let's say that word again. This is an anaerobic process. You do not want any exposure to air from that cider. You want to minimize that. You want the uh, anaerobic bacteria at 50 degrees to be the ones that are working on your cider. Uh, next question, I used honey once to sweeten a hard cider and had sediment from the honey in the bottle. Live with it or do you give time to settle out before bottling? Good question. Um, when you're racking that cider, which is siphoning it out of the carboy, um, that allows you to leave the lees in the bottom and if, and if you're getting the slow fermentations that you're looking for on cider, uh, the first ferment, fermentation takes around six weeks. The second can take anywhere from two to three months or longer. Uh, you, you are going to clarify that cider down to a very, very pretty yellow, and it won't have uh, any sediment in it, and you won't have to worry about it. Uh, in my earlier attempts, as uh, a couple of friends will acknowledge, uh, I was not that patient. I bottled it. You end up with a little sediment in each bottle, and then you're playing the game of trying to get it out of the bottle without the sediment. Uh, it's kind of ugly, but it doesn't change the taste. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, you can live with it, or you can just take your time. And if you're, if you're getting the right kind of a, a, a fermentation, a nice slow fermentation, uh, that's uh, that's going to pretty much solve your problem in filtering out anything that you you think might be a little ugly. Uh, second last question: How much juice do you get from one pressing or one bushel? Good question. About uh, I'm getting around two two and change gallons per bushel, maybe two and a quarter gallons per bushel. It depends on the apple and it depends on my patience. You can leave uh, you can leave it in the press for an hour and maybe eke out another half pint. Uh, or if, you're, if you've got a lot of apples and you're just trying to get through it, uh, you, might, uh, you might only be getting about two gallons. But I would say it's reasonable to expect at least two gallons from a bushel of apples. And last question here. Uh, Vermont folk medicine, apple, cider, vinegar, and honey in a glass of water. Have you heard of this? No, but it sounds good. Um, sounds like a, I'd try it questions we have. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have success in making our Okay, thank you, Al. Um, I'm going to jump in now. This is Mike. Um, give you a little bit of advice from my end. I don't happen to have an apple orchard like Al does. However, I do have a, uh, a gentleman up the street who has an apple orchard and a press, so I just take my five-gallon fermentation bucket um, up there and let him do the hard work, and I just pitch the yeast and go to town on it. So it's, it, it's a good, fun hobby to have, and I appreciate you, Al, for getting us started with that. And moving a little bit away from uh, um, the cider, but staying in the same realm, I'm going to be talking about forest brews and making beer better. Um, I, for those of you who haven't met me, don't know my voice, I'm Mike Burns. I'm a forester by training and by practice. And currently I have the distinction of being the certification manager for the American Tree Farm System. Um, Mackenzie asked me to uh, tell you a bit about my hobby, which is making beer. And 
how I use stuff from the woods to make it even better. I've been home brewing for about 15 years. Um, I wanted to do it longer ago, but my wife refused to move the equipment around uh, while we were just renting. So until I bought the house, we weren't allowed to home brew. Uh, I got interested in it because on my mother's side of the family, um, they've actually owned and operated a brewery here. I am in upstate New York since 1888. So what I'll do is much like Al is I'll go through and explain the process first and then answer any questions you have at the end. So as we go along, just type them in the chat window there in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. <clears throat> now, if you can make a pot of coffee, you can make a batch of beer. Um, the process is about the same, uh, as are the infinite uh, combinations of tastes and flavors uh, that can result. Um, beer making is uh, simply using water to pull the sugars out of a grain. It's usually barley, but also wheat and oats uh, are used, and then those sugars are fermented. And you can see up there, that's, that's pretty much all what home brewing is, is you put the grains in a, uh, in a, uh, a uh, cheesecloth bag and boil them to get the sugar out of it, and now that's called the wort. Um, and from that, uh, you often would add extract or um, powdered malt as well, in addition to get some more sugars in the water. You can do all grain, but that, that's pretty uh, uh, advanced. I've only done a couple of those. It quite honestly seems like an awful lot of work for the little bit of equipment that I have and use. Um, and then you put in the hops and any other flavoring and you boil it down for a while. A lot like Al was saying with cider, the reason that beer has been uh, so great over the centuries and why it's often uh, much easier to uh, drink than the water in many areas is because you're boiling it down. You're getting rid of all those impurities and killing off any bacteria that are in the water. Um, and then once you do that, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to crash cool it. You're going to take it as quickly as you can from the boiling temperature where it's been boiling for a while to really get those sugars to, to, to uh, uh, settle and create the flavors and get it down to a temperature at which you can then what's called pitch the yeast. That's where you're putting the yeast into uh, the, the wort itself. Um, unlike Al, who relies on natural, ye naturally occurring yeast, and he's got that temperature down that he likes, home brewers often uh, prefer to go out and buy the, um, uh, a particular strain of yeast uh, so that they know exactly what we're getting, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, and then comes the hard part, and that's waiting. Uh, once the yeast is in there, usually within hours, it starts to work and will go for about a week. And then what you can do is you can go that week and then move it over to what's called a secondary fermentation process, the secondary fermenter. And those same big five-gallon glass carboys that Al showed are what I've got kicking around here in my house. And you move it from the bucket basically over into the carboy, and that's just to let settle out a lot of the, uh, the impurities, any of the uh, spent grains, any of the yeast that has been working. All that stuff will then settle out, and that's where you get yourself a nice, clear color in the beer. If it is a little bit cloudy, you know, some of them, particularly the, um, the wheat beers, they like it to be a little bit cloudy. You'll always get a little bit of sedimentation in the bottom of a bottle of uh, home-brewed beer because you're actually going to be putting in, and this is the last um, uh, thing that they're showing over here, you're actually going to be putting a little bit of sugar back into uh, the batch right here, and that's called priming sugar and that's to ensure that your beer isn't flat. So that yeast, uh, the yeast is going to work on those added sugars. You're going to get a little bit of sediment in the bottom of the bottle, and there's two thoughts on that. One is that you don't want it in there at all. I don't think it affects the flavor of the beer at all. The other option is that it's really nothing more than spent um, yeast cells and a lot of vitamin B12, so if you're having a lot of home brews, um, that's a great hangover cure for them. So... And that's what that looks like. And here's what it looks like really when you're home brewing. This is literally in my neighbor and best friend's garage here next door. Um, this is the, uh, the 10 gallon, or I'm sorry, the five gallon uh, bucket that he's got the water boiling in and those grains are in there and they're boiling away. And this little bucket right here on the other side of the snowblower, um, that's my fermenting bucket. And you take the, the wart, 
from here and put in any additional water and throw it in there and you pitch the yeast and you put the cap on it and you ignore it for about a week. So uh, it's, it's really quick and easy and, and a lot of fun. So, um, well, modern beers, let's go back a second now. Modern beers all really trace their roots to Bavaria. Uh, and where in November of 1487, Duke Albert IV specified that only three ingredients, the, Walter, the, 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 Walter, the water, the malt, and the hops could be used in making the beer. Uh, those German purity laws are known as the Reinheitsgebot. Did I pronounce that right, Al? Reinheitsgebot. Reinheitsgebot. Okay, I knew you'd help me with that. Reinheitsgebot. That's the germ purity laws. And each of these three ingredients, um, the water, the grain, the hops, how they are prepared is what really gives the different styles of, of beer the character, their characteristic flavors. And no, that isn't a picture of me all the way on the right-hand side. Um, so this is what's called the periodic table of beers, are often referred to as the periodic table, okay? And it goes from the very light and hoppy on one side um, to the rich and thick and malty uh, on the other end of it. Um, much like Starbucks coffee is roasted until it is very dark and the grounds, a lot of grounds are used to pack a lot of flavor, uh, the porters and the stouts and the darker beer, darker colored beers are very rich like that in malt flavor, okay? Whereas the, uh, the lighter ones, the pilsners you're used to seeing, as well as the, uh, the pale ale, things like that, they use a very lightly roasted malt, and that's why they don't have that color necessarily either. Uh, and the basic split between the two sides that you see on the left are ales. Um, ales ferment at a warmer temperature, usually about 70, 75 degrees. So when I'm making an ale, uh, particularly in the wintertime, it's going to be in the uh, living quarters upstairs in my house here. And the lagers prefer a much, much lower uh, temperature. They pr pretty much stop fermentation about 55 degrees, so if you can get it less than 50. So oftentimes you'll see lagers uh, particularly home-brewed, either in a refrigerator or except here in the great northeast, I can do it in my basement, except this spring, in which case my basement was too cold to even get the loggers up and going. So um, talk to you a little bit about the grains. This is what uh, the grains look like when they're actually roasting. If you're ever in uh, Colorado and get the chance to visit the Coors Brewery, which makes that place very interesting. It's the only one I've ever been to that actually has the malt house there. And they bring in the raw barley, and they actually get it to germinate and then roast it. And that's what malting is, is you take the seed and you actually get it to germinate and start growing to release the sugars, stop it, and then how it's roasted if it's roasted high temperatures first and then the temperature is brought down, it kind of burns the outside, and that's what gives it the darker color, the darker, the deeper flavor. So this is the actual picture of the actual malt house in, uh, in Golden, Colorado that Coors uses. Um, and then there's the hops. And the hops provide the signature bitter aftertaste that beer is usually associated with. Um, it's a natural preservative, and so if that bitter aftertaste is what you don't like about beer, if, you, if you're not a particular big fan of beer, um, you might want to try a style that is made with very light hop flavoring or with no hops at all. And you're wondering, well, how do I know that? Well, we pop back here to the periodic table, and you'll see that one of the uh, uh, measures here on the periodic table actually says IBU, okay? And what that is, is that's known as the international bittering units. And the higher that number is, the more hops that are packed into it, the more intense that flavor. So if you don't like the hops or the bitter aftertaste, look for something with a very low IBU. Um, okay. So let's get going from there. And so, again, once you've got the, the malt there and you're throwing in the hops and you're boiling it along, you have what is called the wort, okay? Now, if you're paying attention, and I'm assuming you are, you notice that one very important ingredient was missing from that slide about the Reinheitsgebot, and that was the yeast. 
And that's because it wasn't until almost 200 years later after the uh, German purity law was passed that uh, Louis Pasteur proved the microbial fermentation um, and that it was realized that yeast is what created beer. So Al kind of already gave away the answer here, but what the uh, ancient brewers would do is they would use this instrument right here, which is called a mash paddle. And they would use that when they were stirring the wort uh, as they were making their beers. And so the yeast would stay on that mash paddle, and those mash paddles would actually be handed down from generation to generation, and that's what really gave any particular brewery its signature flavor. But again, today um, what we do is we use particular strains of, uh, of uh, yeast that ferment at particular temperatures, give off particular flavors, those sorts of things. Um, uh, and it's a lot of fun to experiment with different types of yeast to see uh, what, what it does to the beer itself. Um, a lot of people uh, will keep very, very extensively detailed notes on what they're, how they did it every time so they can recreate that exact beer. Um, those are some really good craft brewers. I picture myself as more of an artisanal, bull, uh, an artisanal brewer where you know, I'm an artisan. I don't necessarily want to do it again. I'm just having fun as I'm doing it. So now you're saying to yourself, well, yeah, this is all good and fun and everything, but uh, what does this have to do with my woodlot? Well, the good news is we're not in 15th century Bavaria anymore, and so part of the fun of making your own beer is putting the different flavors into it, okay? And uh, pretty much it was the Belgians, not the Germans, but the Belgians who really pioneered uh, adding the taste to their beers. Um, they put the stuff in that they liked uh, to make their own food better, so they put it in beers. And particularly because these beers, these dark beers uh, that Belgium is often noted for, were often brewed in monasteries for consumption during the pre-Easter period of Lent when the monks were required to fast. So they basically drank their bread uh, and included grains of paradise or ginger, uh, anisette, uh, orange peel, coriander, vanilla, cinnamon, cloves, all good stuff that would complement the taste of the barley or the other uh, uh, grain that they were using to make the beer itself. Um, me personally, I'm, I grew up and lived most of my life in the Northeast, so I like maple, and I like to brew with maple. It's, it's something you can only have a, a short time frame to be able to do the best, um, but it can be done in a couple of ways. Uh, you can add maple syrup to the wort itself when you're brewing. Um, I've done that a few times, particularly it works extremely well with the porters, which is a little bit of a dark beer and has a bit of a sweet flavor to it, and I'm seeing more and more um, maple beers like that uh, uh, a lot uh, as you're going along um, that are starting to come back more and more. Uh, I think the best success I ever had, though, was I went up, and that's actually my son there with the uh, maple bucket, I went up to the sugar shack up the road and got five gallons of the maple sap and started with the raw sap straight out of the tree, um, which was really interesting. You not only got the good flavor from the maple, but you also got some of the minerals out of the uh, ground from where the, the, the trees were growing, as well as a very, very hint of the wood flavor itself. So it was just a wonderful thing um, to be able to do. So again, I would suggest from my experience to use the syrup in a heavier or darker beer, something along the lines of a porter or a stout. Um, and for the lighter beers, uh, you, you may want to use the uh, sap. But, you know, maple isn't the only thing that you can get flavored beer with that you've got out there on your woodlot. Um, get imaginative, uh, whatever you like to taste. Uh, a colleague of mine taps birch trees and even walnut trees for syrup. Uh, you can try using those flavors in your beer. Um, berry juices, you'll see a lot of different flavored beer. Like standing rules usually don't fruit the beer, but you know what? I've had some that were amazing, including a watermelon, uh, Kolsch, which is a very light wheat beer. Um, you know, what have you got growing out there? Blackberries, elderberries, mulberries. Uh, what you'll want to do, though, in particular, is get the juice out of it and make sure that you strain the seeds. 
Um, cheesecloth works amazing for that to be able to squeeze out the juices but uh, strain it so that you don't get the seeds and the other impurities in the water that you just got done boiling so that you get good beer. Um, I was recently at a local microbrewery and they actually had a cherry beet beer um, and whereas Al just got done talking about you don't want to get the bacteria and the impurities in there, they actually introduced a little bit to that on the cherry and it makes what's called a sour beer. A sour beer is not like any beer you've ever had before. It's real interesting. You're not going to drink a lot of them if you've never had it. It is super refreshing and a great palate cleanser, it, but it's very different than, uh, than any beer you'd be expecting. And this just had a, an amazing flavor to it. Um, another idea is that uh, the neighbor of mine that you showed you there earlier, um, he made a batch one time that was infused with apples. He cut up a uh, gosh, probably about a half a bushel of Granny Smith apples and just put it right down in the bucket when it was aging and uh, had them sit that way for about a month or two and really infused the flavor, particularly the crisp flavor of the Granny Smith, into the beer. So that was, that was great. Um, juniper berries. Um, I saw this and you know, somebody was, I heard somebody's got it out in commercial now using juniper berries. Rose hips, winter greens, um, anything you've got on your lot. What you can do, much like I did with the maple sap, is start with a tea made from the stuff. Uh, you know, throw that into the water before you start adding in your grains or your uh, malt extract to really make the, the uh, wort itself. So you can go through all that. Um, and you know, what have you got on your property? You got blackberry leaves, stag sumac. You make some sumac tea. Um, flavor it with things from the forest. You know, get get creative. Um, you have uh, gin, wild ginger, maybe, or possibly even ginseng. Um, a lot of areas now uh, they have some hops that have escaped cultivation. Uh, wild hops. And hops can be used either fresh or you can dry them to really get uh, the uh, flavor out of them. Usually when you're brewing, you're using dried hops because it's much easier to transport them. You're limited only by your imagination and your taste preference, okay? I'll tell you, if it's edible, flavorful, and enjoyable, consider throwing it in and making it part of your beer. So I know now that, you know, you guys are all riled up and, and ready to go, but in – you're asking me, Mike, so how do I get started? Well, the easiest way uh, is to go to a brew, find a brew shop and uh, go get the brew bucket or order it online. Um, this is actually a picture of the hardware store a couple miles from my house, and they are now carrying brew, brewing and winemaking supplies. Um, I've also had a lot of success ordering products from uh, the Northern Brewer, um, you can find those guys online, and a local sh any local shop can point you in the right direction. Uh, if you want to talk about talk to other home brewers, find out what they're doing, possibly join a club, swap recipes, those sorts of things. Um, the easiest way uh, to do it is you know the bucket system, and uh, you can see here. You've got these five-gallon fermenting buckets. Uh, you'll need a couple of them, one to do the fermenting and one to do the bottling out of. Um, but that all comes in this great little kit. Um, it'll include the, the ingredients, the instructions, um, the whole shebang. This one here at the uh, hardware store up the road was 70 bucks. Um, so that's for the full kit with both your buckets, all your tubing, even your bottle capper that Al had talked about. Okay, these particular kits here, these are the actual kits for making different varieties of beer, and they will vary in price any place from $25 to $50 a piece, depending on the style and the type of grains and the hops used. Uh, each one of those kits is going to make you about five gallons of very high-quality beer without costing you a whole heck of a lot of money. It's, it's a bit of a hobby, but it's a fun hobby to have. Um, you know, I mentioned the bottles, and yeah, you'll, you'll, you can buy the bottles. Uh, they actually have them for sale here, but personally, um, I prefer to empty them myself. Uh, so, you know, go out and get yourself a couple of cases of good beer, the ones without the screw caps. Al mentioned the, uh, the Coronas, but also Sam Adams, um, Saranac, any place that says, you know, you have to use an opener, 
Look for those types of bottles. Those are great ones to be able to use. Um, there's the brew kit. And you know, a few more piece of, pieces of advice for you. Um, first of all, get the book. Uh, this book right here, The uh, Complete Guide of Home Brewing, was written by a gentleman, Charlie Papazian, who is generally accepted as being the, uh, the, the father of modern uh, home brewing. Um, well worth the money. Uh, you can pick it up in any homebrew shop or order it from Amazon for about 10 bucks. If you buy either the brew kit or the book or anything else from Amazon, be sure to name the American Forest Foundation as the, chair, as the charity of your choice on Amazon Smiles to ensure that we can continue to, uh, uh, the funding to bring you informational opportunities just like this one we're talking about here right now. So that's number one. Um, Second, um, brew it outside a little bit. Um, I mentioned my family. The, uh, the uh, my mother's family actually had a brewery. For, it still has a brewery here in upstate New York. And I remember going and visiting my grandfather and smelling the wort boiling and, and all that grains and everything. And it was just, to me, the most beautiful smell ever. And my wife walked in the first time we're boiling it up in the kitchen and says, oh, my God, what is that god-awful stench? And, well, not everybody likes that smell. I do, but it's, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. So you know, brew it outside for a little bit. And the other thing is you're putting a lot of steam in the air. If you're trying to peel wallpaper off of a room, then this is a great way to do it. Um, third thing, sanitize. Can't stress this enough. Um, if uh, anything gets near your beer, any bacteria, it's in the lines, in the buckets, anything it's going to make a sour beer, and it's really going to ruin the batch for the most part. So um, you know, go ahead and make sure you get it sanitized. This is exactly what I use is the, the sanitizer tablets that are made for the restaurant, and it works fantastic. And finally, just sit back, relax, and enjoy it. The toughest part of making beer is waiting the, uh, the, the any place from two to six weeks for it to really mature uh, before you can drink it. So um, I got a lot of questions I can see down through here, and I'll start in on them now. Uh, let's see. Uh, first question, in adding yeast to the beer making process, I guess that you want enough to seed the mixture. How much yeast is enough? Uh, how much yeast is enough? Well, I usually got the, the yeast comes in little packets. Um, it actually looks not too different than the um, yeast package you pick up when making bread. It's about half the size, but it's a completely different strain of yeast. It, I don't know how much it weighs, but it's that small little size. You can also um, purchase it in a liquid form, and once you get really good at making beer and you've taken, an, uh, taken your hobby way entirely too far, um, what you'll do is you'll start saving the yeast out of a particular batch out of the bottom and just reusing that yeast. That's how the major breweries do it. Uh, Budweiser, the reason every Budweiser beer tastes the same is because over the centuries they've grown that same batch of yeast and they reuse it in all of their facilities in every batch of beer. So the yeast does make a bit of a difference. Um, second question, what other grains can be used in making beer? Uh, like I said, primarily it's, it's barley, but also, like I said, whatever you've got, um, um, uh, oats, uh, wheat. Uh, the pilgrims, when they landed, they, didn't, they landed uh, first out in Provincetown, out on the Cape Cod. Uh, the reason that they landed there wasn't because it's the first place they hit land. The reason they landed there is because they were out of beer and you couldn't drink the water. So when they landed, what, what, one of the first things they did actually is they found some of the Indians' stashes of corn, and they used the corn to make their beer. So you can make it out of just about any grain that there is. It's not all uh, – it may not be the best thing in the world, but it's better than no beer at all. So I've never made corn beer. Um, I'm not certain I would want to. A lot of places, uh, particularly the larger beer breweries, do put in corn and rice. Uh, but that's mostly as a filler. Uh, the higher the quality, the higher the content of the barley and the uh, other uh, grains like that, the better quality of the beer. 
Um, question. So going back to the monks in uh, Belgium, they were high most of the time. No, actually, they were drunk most of the time, as were most uh, uh, people in Europe at the time. Um, they really couldn't drink the water, so they had to find a way to sanitize it, and boiling it to make beer was the way they did it. Um, they also made a much lower alcohol content in the beer. If you ever see something called a session beer, these beers usually have a less than four per, uh, less than four and a half percent, I think it is, alcohol. And they're called a session beer because, well, you can sit down and drink them for a very long time. Uh, next question. Any experience using walnut, nut, walnut meat? Um, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't personally done it, but like I said, if you can throw it in, uh, get some flavor out of it. Um, the great thing about the Internet these days is you can Google just about anything and find either a recipe or a way to do it. Um, I'm not certain how the oils in the nut would do in the beer itself, but you know, if you're not certain, um, there's two options. Uh, that you can buy kits that make less than the five gallons. So you can try a one-gallon kit or a three-gallon kit and uh, you know, find out how it works before you ramp up production. So next question. In making batch beers, if you do not like it, you can always throw it away. You can. Uh, I guess that would be good to keep record track of batch beers so that if you like a batch, you can make it again. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. Again, um, a lot of people will keep notebooks and journals uh, to know exactly what they did, so if it does turn out fantastic, they can repeat it. Um, the other thing that is often done um, through the beer making, throughout the beer making process, and let me go back here to this slide quickly, is uh, before you pitch the yeast here and also before you bottle it, before you pitch the yeast, which would be here, and before you bottle it down here, you take what is called the gravity reading. Um, that's the specific gravity, you know, where it lines up against water. And so you have the original gravity here before fermentation starts and the ending gravity here after fermentation ends. And from that, you go to the periodic table or final gravity, and you'll see the original gravity and the final gravity. And what that does is that's a measure of both the starting and the residual sugars, and that will give you a very good idea of what this number, the ABV, the alcohol by volume, is going to be. Um, I think that juniper berries are a component in gin, correct? Yes, I believe you are correct in that juniper berries are what give gin its flavor. So if you're using juniper berries and making one of these lighter ales over here on this side, you know, you could make yourself a, a, a martini ale, potentially. Um, next th qu question, comment. I guess that one should not be too creative. One may make poison. Do you agree? Um, it is potential. That's why I would not use anything that isn't edible uh, in the beer. Um, you know, get, make it in a small batch. Um, I was curious about the walnut meats and the oils and how they would work out, but you know, check online. Um, depends on how uh, uh, adventurous you feel like being. Next question: What about using whole grains from a health food store or supermarket for making beers? Um, for the most part, whole grains won't work. Uh, what you're going to want is you're going to want the, the, the grains to first, they need to be malted. And again, that's where uh, you've, you've got them uh, uh, germinating and starting. And then you're going to roast them. And that's really what you're getting the sugars from. Uh, and then beyond this, if you're going to use uh, all grain recipes, um, which is kind of what this here is showing, where you're steeping the grain. You've got all the grains in that bag. You're not just taking the raw grains. You're actually crushing them first in order to open it up to release it and uh, release the sugars. So that's what you're fermenting is the sugars that you're boiling out. Question, what about using five-gallon plastic buckets? Um, that's the most common way it's done. Uh, you'll see right here, this is my uh, personal five-gallon fermenting bucket. Um, here is the temperature gauge right there on the side so that I know what temperature uh, the, the wart is at so that if I'm brewing a lager, 
and it's getting too warm, I can move it to a cooler place, or like this spring where I had it in my basement and it didn't get above 40 degrees, it wouldn't start fermenting, so I had to move it to a warmer place in order to make sure it happens. Uh, will the plastic affect the taste of the beer? Um, well, partially that's what the sanitizer is for, and partially that's why you always ensure you use food-grade buckets. Um, I don't use my buckets for anything other than uh, the brewing, the fermenting, the bottling, that's it. Same thing with my, uh, with my uh, pot there. Um, I do not make lobsters in it. I do not boil potatoes or corn or anything else. That is specifically for my beer, even though it's stainless steel, I want to make sure that there are no um, accidental flavors that are leached out into it. Um, next question, should wooden barrels be used? Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, the nice thing about the uh, plastic buckets is that they can be sanitized so well and so easily and so quickly, and they're so readily available. Again, um, shoot forward here to the uh, Ace Hardware store up the road from me, and you've just got these brew buckets right there, and you can grab them and go. Um, the other nice thing about the brew buckets, these are the lids for them. They do have the seal right there in the lid, so you know you're getting an airtight seal. And what actually happens is, you know, this will hold a little bit more than five gallons, so you'll have the wart within a couple of a few inches of the top, and then as it as it brews, um, the carbon dioxide is going to be released from the yeast, which is fermenting the sugars, and that carbon dioxide is going to force the air out, and that's what you actually see bubbling out through the airlock at the top that Al showed you earlier. Uh, for sanitizing, what about dilute chlorine bleach? There's a, a, a number of different ways uh, that you can use the sanitizer. Um, you can use the uh, chlorine bleach. You can use... Um, uh, iodine. Um, I prefer the sanitizer tablets because for the most part they're no rinse, so you just dunk it in the sanitizer, go straight to town, and it doesn't have any uh, uh, flavors or scents associated with it, which is often my concern uh, in using chlorine bleach is that you don't want to over bleach like your fermentation buckets and get some of that chlorination flavor into it, and then that would leach out into your next batch of beer. Um, called seed yeast to keep reusing, correct? Uh, that sounds about right, um, but yeah, I've, I've never done it, so I'm not quite certain. Uh, question, what about using millet for beer making? Again, if it's a grain, if you can malt it, you can crack it, you can boil the sugars out of it, you can use it to make beer. I'm not quite certain what it would taste like. Um, I've never actually ate millet. I put it in the bird feeder out back, but um, that's about it. Uh, let's see, next uh, follow-up on the walnut meats. There's a microbrewery in Missouri using walnut meats. Um, okay, uh, you know, if you got the opportunity and you can tour their plant, ask their brewmaster about it. One of the great things about brewing is uh, if you get the chance to meet the brewmaster, they're more than happy to talk about their craft and what they do. They're not going to give you all their state secrets, but um, they will be more than happy to, uh, to talk to you about it. Um, Last question, what about making beer from wild edible grains like foxtail millet, plantain seed, wild rice, etc.? cetera? Um, you can do it. Again, anything that, as long as it has the sugars into it, and that would be the question, is how much sugar content you're going to be able to seep out of those grains and into your wort itself so that the yeast has something to ferment. So... That looks like all the questions uh, allotted for me, so I'll turn it back over to you, Mackenzie. Well, we are right on time because I had scheduled this to be just a little bit longer than an hour, and so thank you all. I hope you got your questions answered. Um, reminder that we have some more webinars coming up and that you will all be receiving the slides and the recording. Um, and actually, I downloaded that beer periodic table too, uh, so I'll attach that as well. Um, but thank you all, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>